this is part two of our series, Truth and Love, What God Has Joined Together, Let No Man Separate, The Marriage of Truth and Love. And in the first part, we asked some questions about, uh, you know, how are we coming across to people? Are we uh, extreme on this hardcore, I believe the truth, uh, so I'm going to be a bully about it, forgetting that Christ has been long-suffering and gentle toward us? Uh, or are we going to the other side and just being, uh, y- you know, just wanting to uh, mix it up with others and, 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 and too scared of how uh, people would respond if, if something we believe is maybe not held uh, by the majority of Christendom, right? So, you know, we can go to extremes. Again, though, how are people perceiving us? Or are we fearful, right? Are we, are we fearful of how people will respond? So this is part two. And so we're going to begin our uh, journey through the scriptures as what, uh, you know, regarding what the scriptures have to say about the unity of truth and love. They are inseparable and we mustn't attempt to divorce them. You might be saying, well, I'm not attempting to. Well, we do by our spirits when we're mean. If we're committed to truth, right? Which is wonderful. Be hardcore committed to truth. But if we're not doing it in love, it really shoots us in the foot, okay? And it nullifies our message and sometimes even makes people angry, all right? So this is part two. Well, our first passage is in Hosea chapter four, verse one. How did the prophets feel about this? Hear the word of the Lord, sons of Israel, for the Lord has a quarrel. Now watch this. Yahweh has a quarrel with the people of the land because there is no truth, so that's a problem, nor mercy. Mercy is the same as love, okay? Uh, Micah 6, 8. We know the passage, he has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justly. That means everything's fair. Don't elevate yourself. We're all on the same playing field. We desperately need God's grace. Uh, To love mercy, right? To love, go and learn what this means. I want mercy and not sacrifice. Uh, and, and And to walk humbly with your God. So humility, right? Is arrogance, bullying, is that humility? No, it's not. Mercy, there's no truth nor mercy. Both were lacking among the Israelites. What did Jesus say? Go and learn what this means. I want mercy and not sacrifice. But what else did he say? You do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And both of those are really directed toward the Pharisees. So they didn't know the scriptures, they didn't know the power of God, and they didn't love mercy. Okay, so those go hand in hand. So here's the quarrel. There's no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land. Couldn't get clearer, right? Very important. Ephesians chapter four, and this is probably one of the most well-known passages, verse 15, but that you speaking the truth, how in love may in all things grow up to him who is the head, even Christ. Okay. Now I love the Weymouth translation. It's kind of interesting, but we shall lovingly hold to the truth or speak to the truth. The, the, the word there is, is, is used just a couple of times, but it really means to tell the truth or speak to truth. In other words, you hold it. It's, it's like everybody knows this is what is dear to your heart, but it says lovingly, lovingly, lovingly is really a warm, tender term. And, and man, I need to embrace that. I need to constantly work on, on that in my life. And not just as it pertains to the Bible, but just in, in how I deal with people in general. You know, when you have an angry, uh, when you go to get coffee and the person is just in a bad mood or you go through a drive through man, it, you, you just want to lash out at them or someone cuts you off. You know, this is everyday life, right? But specifically in regard to our proclamation of the truth, We need to speak lovingly, tenderly, with kindness, gentleness, right? Uh, Philippians 4, let your gentleness be made known to all. And uh, shall in all respects grow up into union with him who is our head, even Christ, right? So this is all about Christ. 2 John chapter 1 verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace, right? Will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, what? in truth and in love. Look at that wonderful association, in truth and love. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? 
So he's talking about how we treat the body of Christ, right? And that word uh, goods is generally used in the scripture as you're living this, this earthly life. This is not talking about so much Zoe, our eternal life in Christ, but just our, our earthly life here, okay? So when you see someone lacking just basic things, one of your brothers and sisters, but you don't, you don't help them, where's the love of God? right? Little children, let us love, watch, let us love not in word or in speech. In other words, not with uh, feigned lips. Like Jesus said, this people draws near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. It says, let us love not in word or in speech, just with lips, but in truth and action. In other words, actually be merciful. Don't just talk about it. Ooh, this is convicting for me. <laughs> really convicting. Man, when I read 1 John, I, you know, some Christians like to stay away from it. No, I go straight to it because it reminds me, love is preeminent and so is truth. They are one flesh. Don't put them asunder. Don't divide them, okay? In truth and action. And by this, look, you wonder, you ever wondered whether you're a believer? I do. I have doubts. Am I truly a child of God? You know when it happens the most? is when I am not behaving in a loving way, when I am not demonstrating God agape love. And by this, what he just said, we will know that we are from the truth, right? And we'll reassure our hearts before him. You want assurance? Man, we struggle with that. All of us, if you're truly a child of God and you've never struggled with your assurance, wow, <laughs> Most of us who are normal, we struggle at times with our assurance. Whether we're catching ourselves face first in some area of disobedience or whether we're being unloving. Now, what does James say? He says, we all stumble in many ways. But oh, when we control our tongue, that's a complete person. Right? Our tongue. Are we bitter? Are we judging? Are we anathematizing? Man, I'm, I, the longer I live, the more reluctant I am to throw out anathemas. That's scary. That's scary. The Council of Trent, it's filled with anathemas against those who believe in justification by faith. Do we want to be an anathema uh, thrower? Do we want to throw out all these accusations? Hey, you're not the Apostle Paul and neither am I, right? Jesus Almighty God has the authority to say to the Pharisees, how can you escape the damnation of hell, right? Or Paul throwing out an anathema. You know, whoever does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Oh, that's a truth. But man, I'm scared to throw out that kind of a thing. I just simply say what the scripture says. But man, to come to people like some of these, oh gosh, I see some of these supposed believers in sovereign grace anathematizing believers in fulfillment, right? We've all seen what they did to, to David Chilton. Here's a guy who was sovereign grace and then he comes to see fulfillment by the grace of God and then he's just attacked and anathematized by all of these theologians. And they're out there, you know, they're vocal, the Jim West, the Sandlins, the you know, Gary Norths, the Kenneth Gentries. They, they love to anathematize. They delight in it, okay? They love this. We should not love that. Don't love that. Don't delight in trying to pronounce someone accursed. Man, let God do that. That's his domain. That's not ours. And don't act like you're an inspired apostle because you're an inspired apostle because you're not. Don't act like you are a miraculously gifted elder because you're not. If you're an elder of a church or a pastor, well, first of all, that's a first century miraculous giving or gifting. Okay, if you want to call it miraculous or supernatural or charismata, that's in Ephesians 4. You know, he gave them pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists right? Apostles, listen, if you insist that you are one of those today, don't use that as, as a, a, you know, some sort of power grab or authority grab. No, he's made all of us able ministers of the New Testament, those of us who are his children. So don't, don't think that you've got some sort of power to anathematize. You simply preach the gospel. 
You tell what the gospel says. It is the gospel that enacts the pulling down of strongholds of 2 Corinthians 10. It is the gospel that enacts the triumph. It is the gospel that condemns, not us. I know you see it in Isaiah chapter 4. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you shall condemn, right? Hey, you're looking at it the wrong way. I will condemn you because you have judged me, right? No, when someone condemns us, we say, you know what? You're right. I have disobeyed God many times this morning and many times yesterday and many times it will be in the future. But I don't want to. I just know I'm forgiven by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ says, who shall lay a charge against God's elect? The blood of Christ says, we always triumph in Christ by the gospel. 2 Corinthians 2. The Bible says, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. 1 John, Revelation 1. Revelation 5, that's how you triumph. Let the gospel convict. Preach Christ and him crucified. Don't use your personality. Don't use names. Don't use anathemas. anathemas. You use the gospel. Declare what he's done for your soul when someone accuses you. Amen? Just do it gently. I'm working on it too. I'm right there with you. So let us not, not love in word or in speech, but in truth and action, there it is, truth and love, and by this we will know that we are of the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Struggling with doubts, wake up in the middle of the night like I sometimes do, wondering, oh my gosh, does Jesus love me? Am I his child? You'll have less of that experience of a lack of assurance when you are combining, not destroying you can't destroy it but not attempting to destroy that beautiful marriage of truth and love first peter chapter one now that you have purified your souls by obedience to the truth that's the gospel he's not talking about works there or law he's saying obedience to the truth that is we obeyed the gospel by the grace of god we had faith in jesus christ the faith that only he gives so now that that's happened your souls, your consciences are purified by the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, what? Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, right? So that you have genuine mutual love. Love one another deeply from the heart. Isn't that beautiful? So you have truth and you have love. Fervent love deeply from the heart. Fervent love, one translation reads. So truth and love, very clear. Second Timothy chapter two, he's writing to an elder. Okay, now listen, if you are a self-proclaimed elder or think that the OPC or PCA somehow gave you first century apostolic giving, well, that's false, right? Gifting, that's false. Okay, you don't have that. Now listen, I'm not saying it's wrong if you have been dubbed an elder. I'm just saying, don't use that for authority over people's lives. Don't use that as some sort of uh, green light to anathematize or green light to excommunicate, all right? Don't, don't try and take those things upon yourself. Man, I've done that in the past and man, God had to set me straight. He set me straight. Now all I consider myself is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, along with you. He has made all of us able ministers of the New Testament. Amen? All of us. All right? But here Paul is writing Timothy, elder at Ephesus, and he tells Timothy, and by the way, don't say do within yourself like some of these preterists do. Don't say, oh, well, this doesn't apply to today. Be very careful about that. Be really cautious about uh, uh, things, demonstrations of love that you're actually saying that, well, that passed away. Are you kidding? That passed away? What does the Bible say? The Bible says that faith, hope, and love abide. But it says the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, love. These three remain. We never get rid of faith. We never get rid of hope and we never get rid of love. Amen? So faith, shun youthful passions, pursue righteousness. What is that righteousness? It's the righteousness of Christ. Always pursuing that. You have it. 
but always pursuing it. Our lives should be about his righteousness. That's what he says in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. He says, every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. And he says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord whose righteousness is from me. So we're constantly talking about God's righteousness. Look at it in Psalm 145. They shall speak of his glory and talk about his righteousness all the day long, right? We talk, we declare his righteousness. So pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord. What, how? Out of a pure heart. True, not with feigned lips, uttering the name of Jesus, but our hearts being far from him. That's the Pharisees right? That's the Pharisees. Those are the anathematizing. You have to realize, you have to realize, and I'm not saying all reformers are this way, but I will say this, the scariest people I've ever met are reformers, and I'm sovereign grace, right? And I was there. I was there. I was a scary sovereign gracer. I was one of those scary Calvinists, one of those mean Calvinists. Oh, man, they are the scariest group I have ever met, right? And I was there and thank God he delivered me. Thank God he took me out of that Pharisaic mindset, right? Faith, love, and peace along with those who call out of the Lord out of a pure heart have nothing to do with stupid and senseless controversies. Oh, if anything has been communicated to us through social media and the media at large, it's this. What are we debating over? Have politics consumed your pulpit? Have politics consumed your discussions? I'm not saying it's wrong. You can talk about football, politics, your favorite ale, your favorite food, your disdain for sushi. Shame on you, but no, just kidding, right? But man, these senseless controversies, right? People arguing and becoming enemies over whether the earth is a globe or flat? Good grief. What are we doing? What are we doing? You say, but yeah, but what about all these conspiracies in the government? Tons of them. There are a dime a dozen, hello. You think there was no conspiracy in the time of Nero? You know, recognized by many as the most villainous creature that ever landed on this terra firma, right? Come on. There are always going to be government conspiracies. I'll tell you what, it's one thing to discuss globe earth versus flat earth, but if you have unfriended because of that, if you have divided, if you have become bitter enemies over that, you know, you might, because I hear Globe Earth people get so mad. And by the way, I lean Globe Earth, but I don't know. You know, it's just, it, 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 there's so much stuff out there, right? Man, my, my, my most wonderful, beautiful, intelligent, heartfelt, tender, forgiving, gracious, sovereign grace, kingdom lover, my best friend, he's flat Earth. Hey. I don't look at him as a dummy. Are you kidding? He's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. One of the most gracious men. I, I can't imagine life without him. I'll tell you what. He's, he's, he's a huge part of me. Uh, working through recovery. Working through conquering addictions. And, 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 and I, no, I don't see his position yet on that. I say, yeah, who knows? You know, I don't. I, I, like I said, but we get along great. Why? He discusses it with me and he shows me his points. And, and I'm like, just, you know, I'm not a very scientific guy. I confess I'm not. I was terrible in science. And it's not something that like I obsess over because, I, you know, I, I'm just called to do what I'm doing. I spend all my time doing this. People, please don't do that. Senseless controversies, you know, is the moon a real moon or is it a translucent disc? I don't know. I think it's a real moon, right? Man. And the Lord's servant. We are slaves of righteousness. That will never change. The righteousness of Christ has enslaved us, praise the Lord. 
He must not be quarrelsome. This is so convicting to me. But kindly to everyone. Gosh. I have so many... I'm constantly having to throw out apologies and it gets, I get weary of it. I get weary and I have the most loving, wonderful mom in the world. No one could be so loving to me as my own mom. And yet as a son, sometimes, you know, I irritate her, you know, and and, and I do mean things. I, I talk in a way that is, uh, not becoming of a loving, uh, a loving son or or a believer in Christ. She's the best thing that's ever happened to me on this earth. She is, next to Jesus, of course. Now I was I was, I was stern and sometimes cruel with my two boys. And man, I had to apologize. And even still, sometimes I do. Well. It's been a while, thankfully, but I don't want to be unloving to my boys. And they love me so much. They have forgiven me of so much. He must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone. An apt teacher. That's all the servants. Male and female. We must be ready to teach. Apt. Ready. To give a defense. To defend Jesus, patient, goodness, correcting opponents. Hey, that's a part of what we do. Of course, we were corrected. Hopefully they did it in a way that was kind. But how do we correct them? Correcting opponents with gentleness. So the correction is in the area of information, right? Truth of the gospel. But we do it with gentleness God may perhaps, and here's the sovereignty of God, may perhaps grant that they will repent. God gives repentance. What is repentance? It's a change of mind. It's turning from dead works, Hebrews, to serve the living God. In other words, the change of mind is this. I I reject and renounce self-righteousness and I embrace and turn to the Lord Jesus and his righteousness, his cross. That's repentance. Repentance is not, I turn from bars. I turn from brothels. I turn from football games and dancing, rock and roll. No, we turn from self-righteousness. That is repentance. That is repentance. Jesus said to the Pharisees, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Workers, self-righteousness, they're good deeds. What did John the Baptist say? Repent, do, do works. Who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Do works that are, are, are de- demonstrating repentance, that demonstrate that what you have turned. He's talking to the most outwardly righteous people. He is saying to them, They're they're righteous. They got all their morals in a row. He's talking to people whose outward righteousness, of which Christ spoke, except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And they're like, who can be saved? What? Are you kidding? They had it all morally. They were behaving morally. This has nothing to do with moral transformation. It has to do with what God grants the only way, the only way that we know we have truly repented from self-righteousness and self-justification is if we have trusted solely in the cross of Jesus and believed that he is Lord and that he has risen from the dead and that that same risen Lord, eternal, the Bible says immortal, invisible, eternal, immortal, invisible, dwells in our heart the Lord Jesus that's how we know we have repented that it is God given repentance perhaps in other words when we're doing this when we're correcting with truth in gentleness God may grant them repentance and they would come to know the truth truth and love folks truth and love truth and love